Hey everybody, welcome to Programming 2. This semester is going to be more project-based. Uh, this semester we're going to be working on four separate games, each with their own genre. Uh, last, last year's or last semester's Programming 1 was all about taking a new fundamental of programming each week and learning how we can apply it to a space shooter game. Well, this first chapter's assignment is going to be about three weeks long, and we're going to revisit our space shooter, and we're going to revitalize it, rework it a little bit so we can uh, review some of the basics of what we learned last semester while uh, adding a few new skills to our repertoire. So right here we have the uh, chapters uh, page that you'll find in Moodle. Right now it's just on my uh, SGD blog, but it'll be here in your Moodle as well. Uh, we have the chapter dates. Again, it's going to be about three weeks long. Uh, we have our deliverables uh, on Monday, three weeks from now. You're going to deliver a vertical scrolling space shooter game. I'm going to quickly go over uh, some of the things we're going to change. Uh, here's the chapter introduction. Hopefully you've already read through this, so nothing new here. Uh, right here, you'll find the downloadable resource, which is basically the space shooter game from last semester, but within but used my using my own code, and I have every single line of code commented out, so you can uh, get a nice recap on what each line of code does. So hopefully, you've already downloaded that. Uh, right here, you'll find the lecture that you're watching. So. That's no big deal right there. And here we have our actual assignment. I'm going to go over these new parameters real quickly. Then I'm going to show you the old school shooter game, and then I'll show you the result of implementing all these new features. First, and probably the biggest thing you'll notice right off the bat, is we're going to adjust the perspective of the game to a vertical scrolling setup. So instead of uh, the ship going side to side, we're going to have it going up and down with asteroids coming from the top of the screen. Second, we're going to confine the player's movement to the viewable play field. I don't know if you knew last time we were making our game, but it was uh, possible for your uh, ship to float off the side of the screen and, you know, lose track of your ship. So we're going to figure out a way where we can do that really easily with about three or four lines of code. We're going to create a new fire strip that's going to be more versatile for us. It's going to be able to allow us to control variables such as the fire rate of our gun, the burst fire interval, so how many, how fast the bullets fire within each burst, and the number of shots we're going to fire in each burst. Next, we're going to create a fully automatic machine gun that sprays bullets in a tight cone. So instead of just a single shot or a burst shot that fires straight, we're going to kind of have an uh, inaccurate machine gun that sprays bullets up to the screen. Next, we're going to create a missile volley in which each missile tracks a separate asteroid. I'll show you what we mean in that one uh, in a second. And we're going to display how much time has passed in the UI. And we're going to make a simple scoring system and display that on the screen as well. So let's take a look at the old school shooter game that we uh, had a second ago. And I'm not gonna, I'll get into the code and recap some of the high, high points of the code in a second. But I'm going to go ahead and hit play, and we're going to show you what we were working with last semester. Basically, it was just this vertical thing, and you see how the ship's going off the play field like so. And if you left-click, we had our single shot. If you right-click, we have our burst. And if you middle mouse-click, we have our tracking missile. That tracks the closest asteroid to us. All right, we've already ran out of ammo. And we have all of our asteroids exploding. And you notice we have our health decreasing here. And this is our basic fare. Notice the star field in the background slowly scrolling by. Uh, everything right here should be pretty familiar. So I'm going to go ahead and pause this. And I'm going to bring up the result of what we're going to be working towards. Right here, you can see a, a few new things. Obviously, the ship is now facing forward. I have some spiffy new health and ammo displays right here. I also have a time display right here and a score display right here. I'm going to go ahead and press play, and we'll get into the game. You'll notice something already. Here we have the asteroids coming from the top of the screen. All right. And you'll notice that no matter how hard I try, I can't fly out of the bounds of the background image I've simply placed on a plane here. No matter how hard I try, that includes forward, left, right, and the back of the play field. You'll notice that we have our time limit ticking up every second, and we have a scorecard right here. Uh, my ammo now reads 498, so I'm going to show you how the new weapons work. I'm going to hold down the left click, 
And you'll notice now we have a machine gun that sprays in that tight cone I was talking about. So a little bit more accurate for a machine gun you might find. And then you can already see I'm destroying some asteroids. Every asteroid I destroy creates a score of uh, 100. So I guess I've destroyed about six right here. And I'm going to go ahead and test out our missile. It's a three-round burst that tracks a different asteroid with each missile. As I hold down the left click, you'll notice that some missiles don't get a target. So if they don't have a target, they fly straight forward, and it's basically a wasted missile. You'll notice that I have 38 ammo right in here, and since every missile costs 10 ammo, I'll only be able to shoot one more volley, like so. And if I try to shoot any more with my left click, I'm clicking it right now, I can't shoot any more because our ammo's dipped below 30, but I can fire eight more rounds off. Now I can't shoot anymore. So, you know, we have the same basic stuff going on. If I hit asteroids, eventually I'll be destroyed. And you'll notice the time right here. We're going to keep it simple. We're not going to add minutes. We'll just do straight seconds. And when the ship's destroyed, the time stops, mostly because we have some air codes where the uh, console was still trying to find the ship after you destroyed it. But never fear. Don't worry about that. Uh, we haven't created a windscreen. We're not going to do that this lecture. So those are some of the basic uh, mechanics you're going to be implementing in this class, or in this chapter, rather. So I'm going to take this over here, and we're going to revisit the space shooter here. And I'm going to quickly go over some of the highlights of the code. All right. So let's go over our hierarchy real quickly. And I'm going to take this right there. So we have a few things going on in our hierarchy. We have our main camera, which is, let me take this off of 2D mode. Our main camera is just kind of situated over to the right here. Uh, so nothing big there. We have our medium fighter, and we in our inspector, we have a few scripts attached to it. Remember in our inspector, we have the uh, default uh, classes or scripts already attached to it, like transform and the mesh render. Here we have our player mover script. So let's take a look at it real quickly. I'm going to go over here in my project uh, folder right here. I'm going to click on scripts. And here, let's bring up mono develop by clicking on player mover. I'll bring this over here. I discovered a cool new thing here. If you hold control on Windows and mouse scroll, you can control the zoom of the code here. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit to make it a little bit easier to read. Um, our player uh, mover is pretty easy. It just uses simple vector three uh, movement to move our ship. Uh, we define what axes we're going to be using with horizontal and vertical. These are actually inside of Unity already. already. And what actually uh, defines our way we move in our, uh, our script is by inputting these move horizontal uh, floats right here into a vector three variable. So in our X axis, we're going to move horizontally. And in our Y axis, we're going to move vertically up and, up and down the screen. And we're not going to be moving in and out of the screen with our Z axis right here. So we'll just put a value of zero. And this right here, this uh, gets to our rigid body component we have on our ship as denoted right here. It's our physics controller, basically. And we're going to take our vector three movement variable and multiply it by our speed that we define up here. All right. I didn't really put any comments here. This is all pretty basic stuff that you've probably gotten to. So let's look at our player fire script real quickly. I'm going to double click there. And I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. Uh, right here in our player fire script, uh, we have the bullet, laser, and missile. I left out laser. We're going to leave laser out of here. So I'm going to get rid of that variable. I guess I should have gotten rid of it. But you can go ahead and delete that. And what we have going on right here is a combination of a uh, just a simple uh, fire function right here that fires one shot at a time. And we have a coroutine that fires our burst. So in this line of code right here, if we press left click, which is denoted by 
mouse Z right here in our get key down. We call our fire script right here and it just fires one shot. We pass in a few different uh, values right here. We pass in what we actually want to instantiate. In this case, it's our bullet prefab. And we pass in the amount of ammo our player has. So when we go through our script down here, we can adjust our ammo count like so. All right. So remember, let's see if I can get them in here. The uh, variables denoted in here get passed into these local variables to this fire function. So player stats ammo, that value gets passed into this variable. And bullet right here, which is our game object prefab of our bullet, gets passed into this local game object variable called shot to fire. And we have player stats ammo equal because this function is going to return the variable ammo count. And it's going to update right here. So every time we fire, these uh, func these variables are going to be passed into right here. We're going to instantiate our shot to fire. We're going to take care of our ammo count. And we're going to return that ammo count back up to this line of code. All right. So that's a quick review on that. Our burst fire relied on a coroutine. So when we left right click, we're going to fire a three round burst. So we're going to start our coroutine and we're going to do our burst fire function right here. So that points us to this function right here. Uh, we had to use a coroutine in order to get at this yield weight, uh, return new weight for seconds burst interval. Basically it allowed us to easily create pauses between each shot we fire. And it's just a simple uh, for loop right here in which we loop through each time. And this three right here, we kind of hard-coded how many shots we wanted to fire with just putting three. So for every time we go through the loop, we, we call the fire function right here. All right. So what else do we have on our medium fire? We have our stat script. Remember, our stat script was just a simple uh, script that held va uh, values right here. And this stat script was pretty important because remember how many other functions and scripts and uh, or classes we had that would act, try to access a stat script to see how much ammo we had. In fact, we see that in action right here by trying to get our player stats right here. Uh, this line of code is pretty important uh, right here. This is how we get at the variables and other classes. So we're in our player fire class right now. To understand the ammo count of our player, every time we fire a bullet, we need to get at the ammo count right here in the script. We have to make this local variable right here. So quickly going through it, we uh, typecast the variable as stats. That's the same as typecasting this bullet variable as a game object. So this type of variable is going to be a stats variable. And this is the name we're going to use for our variable right quickly right here. And we're going to set this equal to game object, which points at the game object the script is attached to. So player fire is a script is attached to this medium fighter. So all we have to do is put game object right there. And the uh, Unity knows we're pointing at whatever object our script is attached to. And then we're just finding our game object with player tag and then we're going to do a get component so this is telling unity okay we're going to look at this game object with the tag of player which is our medium fighter with our tag player right here and then we're going to get at the component which is in our inspector and the component we want to get to is right here is our stat script so in these uh brackets right here we put stats and we end it with a parentheses. Now, player stats has been uh, declared a value. And this player stats right here points at our stat script. And player, and this is uh, the player stats variable in action. And we do player stats dot ammo because we want to get at the variable of ammo in our stat script. 
So this will be a line of code that uh, you really you guys need to refresh up on because it's how you access variables from other classes right here. So our stat script just holds all the basic uh, values we need to have to get our game going pretty good. Um, I think that's about it for our player fire, or our player script. Yep. Well, we have a collision script, actually. So our collision script worked with the wonderful public void on trigger enter. This function uh, allows us to track whenever colliders enter one another. So on this on trigger enter, every time a collider, which is this our capsule collider right here we have on our ship. Oh, let me get it. Where did my collider go? So we see our capsule, our green little capsule right here. Since this is marked as a trigger, it no longer no longer has any physical uh, characteristics. <laughs> Guys, don't uh, be sure to upgrade Windows to Windows 10. Thank you, Microsoft. Uh, uh, so we have our collider here. It's a trigger. So within our uh, collision script, we have this nice variable. Every time something enters another collider box, we do all the code here. These three lines of code allow us to uh, ignore when certain objects collide with other objects. Say, for instance, anything tagged with bullet, if it collides with the player, we don't want our own bullets to hurt our player. So if game object dot tag bullet and game other object dot tag equals player, we return and we skip all this code right here. So the thing you need to realize with this game object dot tag and other object dot tag, game object in this sense again points to whatever what other whatever game object our collision script is attached to currently, whatever is colliding, and we define a variable right here, collider other object, to hold the other object we are currently colliding with. So if our game object has the tag of bullet and the other object we collide with has the tag of player, we return out of this uh, function and we skip all this code. This basically keeps our bullets from hurting our player, our player from hurting our bullets, and our hazards from hurting one another. All right. Um, that's a pretty important concept to get down. And right here, we basically just do all the code of destroying our objects and adjusting our health and shields of our player and our other objects. So right here we do a, uh, a local variable right here. We have to get at the stats of whatever object is colliding. So we type cast stats <laughs> as a stats. So this is kind of like the float or int. This is what we call the local variable. And since our collision script is attached to an object that already has a stat script on it, we can just simply do a get component stats. And that'll point, that'll look on the game object our collision is attached to and just get at our stats. I guess we could have, uh, uh, maybe we could have done that already right here with a uh, simple line of code like that. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and use the same kind of. Uh, uh, syntax here to simply get at our stats and the other one. So I'm just going to copy and paste this right here. I don't think we had to add all this. I think we could have simply done this because our player fire already had, was attached to our medium fighter and stats was already assigned to it. So if we do stats, player stats, we can just simply get the component, whatever game object we're attached to. I'm going to hit control S and that works. So there's a lot of ways we could have done that, but I'm going to quickly move ahead and we have to access the stats on the other object. We're also colliding with. So we make a new local variable called the other stats and we're going to look at other object, which is defined right here. As soon as we collide with another object, this other object is the value of, say, the asteroid we're hitting. And then we just do a get component to get the stats there. And here we just do the simple math. 
to adjust the health and the shields here. Remember our shields, uh, not quite visible on our UI, but our shields uh, decrease the damage caused by half. So we have this little uh, math right there. Um, if the shields were greater than zero, then we did this math right here. Or else, if the shields were zero, then we just do a straight health minus the damage caused by the other object we're colliding to. And if both of these fail, then if the health of the object we're uh, hitting is below zero, then we destroy that game object and we instantiate our prefab explosion of our particle system that we have up here. All right. That's a lot, a lot to take in, but I'm just quickly going through this stuff. You guys will probably have to mull over it and maybe revisit some of the lectures of old videos. Um, let's quickly go over where we just have a destroy by time. This is just a general script we have that destroys whatever game object we want to attach to it after a set number of time. We had to create that in order to destroy our particle effects going on in our game. Remember these little shuriken guys right here? If we didn't have the destroy by time, they would just stay in the scene forever and eventually clog up the scene. But we have the destroy by time, so it gets instantiated and destroyed. All right, here we have our HUD. We'll get that to a second. Uh, our asteroid mover was pretty simple as well. Where is that at? Asteroid mover right there. It was simply uh, just a transform translate, like so. You can read the comments to see how it works. We have a lifetime built into it. And as soon as the uh, asteroid is created, we start a destroy function uh, that destroys our object after, well, obviously, our lifetime of 10, 10 seconds right there. Uh, and then in our update, we just have a transform.translate function. Uh, figuring out our vector three dot left, and we multiply that by our object speed, and then we multiply that by time dot delta time, so we can keep the speed within uh, a reasonable time. If we left the time dot delta time off, these asteroids would just be zooming down the sh screen, and uh, our, a lot of our values would be hard to uh, pin down. I'm gonna get rid of some of these scripts up here at the top. Uh, here we have our bullet mover. Same thing is kind of as our uh, asteroid mover for the most part, except in our bullet mover, we have uh, a speed and a lifetime set up right there, just like we have here. Uh, we, but in the bullet, we have to find where we want to spawn the shot. So we create a private variable called shot spawn. It's private because we don't want to see it in the inspector because we go ahead and take care of what shot spawn is equal to right here in this line of code. So shot spawn equals, then we're going to use a game object dot find function right here. And in parentheses, we can put the exact name of the object. We want to assign that variable to called medium fighter right there. And then we set the transform position of our bullet equal to the shot spawn dot transform position, which is our medium fighter. So this line right here just basically matches the position of the bullet to the position of our player. And then we have our transform.translate function going on right there. All right, let's keep moving. Uh, our missile mover, it's probably our, one of our more advanced uh, scripts we have going on right here. This script deals with arrays and uh, using our array to compare the positions of our asteroids. So I'm going to quickly kind of go through this real quickly. Uh, I'm quickly going to do this real quickly. That's nice. So let's go through the variables right here. We have our obvious lifetime and speed. Uh, here we have two float variables that have the current distance and old distance. These values are what are going to hold the uh, values of uh, the two distances between our current asteroid we're measuring and the distance of the old asteroid we were measuring when we we're comparing our asteroids in our array. Here we just uh, declare 
uh, 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 array. Yeah, that's right. We just simply do a game object, and then these brackets right here tell Unity that we're going to be making an array. And we simply just call this hazard array right here. And we have three game objects right here. One, we have to figure out where the player position is. So this game object will hold the actual medium fighter we have right here. And then we have a game object that holds the hazard being measured, which is the asteroid we're currently measuring. And closest hazard right here holds the value of the current asteroid that's closest to our player. And then we have a vector three variable right here that holds the measured distance of our asteroid. Uh, it holds X, Y, and Z coordinates that will tell us basically the distance between or hold the value of the distance between the ship and the current asteroid we're looking at. So when we start, so whenever the asteroid uh, missile is instantiated, we uh, hit this void start. The first thing we need to do is we need to assign the player position the game object of our medium fighter right here. So we're here, we're uh, giving our player position a value. Uh, transform dot position equals player position dot transform. So as soon as the missile is launched, it needs to know the exact position of the player. Right here, we're just kind of giving player position uh, the, the ship value. Here, we need to actually find the position of our ship. So transform dot position equals that right there. Next, we need to give a, a value to our old distance before we go through our array. We need to have an old distance value, and mathf uh, dot infinity creates a pretty large number, which is infinity. Infinity, and we have our destroy. So if our missile uh, misses its target, or the other our target's been destroyed, it won't just fly into infinity; it'll be destroyed after a while. And here we assign what our hazard array is. Um, basically, we do a game object dot find objects with tag. So every object with the tag of hazard will now populate our hazard array. So now we have our array with all of our asteroids inside of it. I want to give us a, uh, an example of the array being populated. So I'll launch my missile. I'll pause it. I'm going to click my missile clone. And here we have my missile mover script right here. And after I fired it, we have my hazard array. And it tells us the size of our array, and it populates our array with all five asteroids on the screen. You'll notice if I click the element here, it'll highlight what asteroid we are in this game scene. So we have all of our asteroids right here. All right. In our, oh, let me select my missile clone again, right there. And then we have our measured distance variable. Uh, right here it has our uh, value, how far away it is in the X uh, axis, and how far away it is in our Y axis. So after we uh, populate our hazard array that we just saw, we go through a for loop. And remember, for loops are really great with arrays because arrays are numbered zero through however long the array is. So with our for loop, we start at int i, this is our counter, and as long as our counter is less than the length of our array, which is five, five elements long, and we're gonna increase our counter by one each time, so we'll be able to go through our whole array with our for loop right here. So we have to do a few things in our for loop right here. We have to uh, assign the hazard being measured, and in this case, it's the first asteroid in our array right here that we have populated. So we simply say our hazard array, and in our brackets, we do i, because right now, i equals zero, because this is the first time through our for loop, remember, dot game object. So our hazard being measured is now our first asteroid in our array right there. Let me just compact that. So I can expand this. So after we're looking at our asteroid zero, remember our rays start at zero, we find our measured distance, which is basically the transform position of the hazard being measured right here. 
which is right currently our first time through the loop at element zero, this asteroid right here. And we minus that by the position of our player. And then we have a current distance. And we need to find the differences in terms of X, Y, and Z. Because right now we're kind of working in vectors. So now we need to turn this value into an easy to read flow. So we just go current distance equals the measured distance dot square magnitude. Square magnitude turns that into a, that uh, X, Y, Z value into a nice float. And then right here is where the magic begins. If our current distance right here is less than our old distance, which is currently math and infinity, the biggest number ever, then our closest hazard will now equal to the, haz uh, the hazard being measured, which is our first asteroid right there. And then our old distance becomes the current distance of our asteroid being measured to the player. <laughs> That's a mouthful, isn't it? So after we go through that, we go back around to the for loop. Now I equals one, and hazard array dot I is pointing at element one in our array. We do the same measurements to find how far away asteroid one is from the player. And all of our, our current distance now equals that distance between asteroid one and our player. And the current distance is now measured against our old distance which is the distance between our player and asteroid zero. And if this new asteroid is closer, then we make the appropriate changes in our code here. So let's move on to our void update. This is what actually moves our missile. And this line of code right here accesses our velocity function on our rigid body. And basically we just push our missile forward like it was being propelled by a rocket on its back times the missile speed that we set up. And then this line of code is uh, important because uh, it checks to see if the closest, ha closest hazard still exists or whether it's been destroyed or not. Uh, if we didn't have this, then if our asteroid was destroyed and two missiles are launched close to one another, then both missiles are going to be looking at the same asteroid. And that could be a problem when our first missile hits, because then our second asteroid is constantly looking for that asteroid, which is destroyed. And that gives us error messages in our game. So basically we say, if our closest hazard is not destroyed, then we're going to do, to do our look at function here. So our missiles are going to look at our object we want to, we want to hit, which is our closest hazard. If the object is destroyed, and uh, our asteroid we're looking for has been destroyed and it is null, then we would skip this look at code and it would just go back to the simple getting pushed forward by a rocket. All right, I'll give an example of that in action. So I'll maximize this on play. All right, so I'm gonna launch two missiles. And notice how they were both going to the rocket. Now it veers off, two missiles. And now I'll run out of bullets. I'll show that again. So both missiles heading for this asteroid. It goes all forward. Now it just keeps going forward. So that's just the way we handle that. So I think that's basically all the code for the most part of the original game. Um, a few things that we still have to maybe consider in our play field right here. Remember, we have this play area right here that destroys asteroids. Let me turn off this maximize here. We can see this in action. So we have our asteroids going on right here. But what happens whenever we don't destroy them and they go off screen? Well, we have this play area here that destroys our asteroids like so. Boom. All right. And... We have our UI elements going on right here. Um, remember, you may want to revisit the uh, video from last semester, and I'll have that posted. Uh, you may want to revisit that so we can see how you can set up a HUD canvas and adjust the image and the text of the fields right here. And if we pull up my HUD right here, we can see how this all works. 
And to save time here, uh, I'll just refer you back to uh, the last lesson. I think it was chapter nine or so uh, about how we all set this up. Or you can refer to the comments right here because I want to get on to uh, some of the new things we need to do in this assignment. All right. So here are the steps we need to do to get our new game running. The first thing we probably want to do is look at our player ship. Let me get out of the 2D here. And notice from our side here, our ship is pointed in the right direction. The first thing I did was I reset just all the values of my position of my ship. So it's now at zero. The next thing I did is I swung the camera up to look directly down on my player. All right. So that's a quick way to quickly get set up with that. And when that happened, I had to do a few things too. I had to reposition my star field. So instead of coming out this way, I had to reposition it so it was floating underneath my ship here. Uh, then I had to reposition the uh, a plane on my uh, uh, for the background image. Remember, I had this new plane here, so I simply just made a game object, uh, 3D object plane, and then. I had a uh, background image right here. I chose one of these, and I just simply applied it and then repositioned it as so. And there's a lot of things we had to do um, to fix the player movement. Oh, yeah, I also had to reposition this play area right here to catch all the trash from my ship. So basically, I had to kind of like bring it over here and then rotate it all that stuff. And then we have to start touching the code now. Um, we had to tweak our player movement. So I'll bring up my uh, player mover script real quick. Um, I, let's see, let me get rid of that. I didn't have to create any new lines of code. I just had to switch some of the values around in my vector three movement. And then I was able to move, you know, Instead of uh, up, instead of up, down, left, and right, I now have to move, you know, and the Z and X axis. So you have to tweak that. Uh, the next thing we have to do is uh, tweak or clamp the player movement within the bounds of the play area. As you can see right here, I can't move outside of here, and I can't go here. So this is a new kind of uh, this is a new uh, feature we're going to be doing or a new concept in programming, and I'm going to bring up a web page right here that documents MathF Clamp. On this page right here, you can find that simply by this is what I did. I just did Unity MathF Clamp, and it brought up the first hit right here, and we can see how. Uh, make sure you're in C sharp. We can see how our math clamp uh, clamps a value between a minimum float and a maximum float value. <coughs> if you want to see this in action and used, uh, there's a certain birdie told me that uh, if you type in Unity Space Shooter, a certain birdie told me that you can find it within this tutorial on the on Unity's website. But I'll leave that for you to find out. So you can learn how to use math clamp inside. I don't know. Maybe it's in that moving the player video. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing right now. But, you know, the inside track is you can go to that resource and find out how to do that. Uh, the next thing we need to do in our game is we need to fix. We really just have to go on and fix the way our bullets move across the screen. All right. So really, that's just kind of figuring out what part of this code do I have to change? And you only have to change one word in this code to get it going right. I'm going to leave that up for you to find. Uh, same thing with the asteroid mover. Again, you just have to tweak one word in this code right here. And then we have to fix our asteroid spawner. 
remember, our, oh yeah, we didn't go over this a second ago, but our asteroid spawner uh, basically just has a, a coroutine going on with our, our infinite while loop. So it's always spawning these. So the thing we have to figure out in this is, well, we have to change some of these uh, min y, max y. Uh, I think you might have to change those to z or x. I can't remember, but I think if you play around with this stuff, you might be able to find out. So you, you have to change a few a few things in this code to get it to come correctly or to come down the screen correctly. Uh, and I think you might have to do something to this line right here. I'm not sure. So that's how we get our, that's what you'll need to do to the asteroid spawner. And next comes a big doozy. We're going to re-look at our, uh, re-evaluate uh, our fire script. Because right now, this is, I'll admit, this is kind of cumbersome the way I set this up. And uh, I don't know if you did the same thing, but I, I think if you would have followed my uh, lecture correctly from last semester, you probably have something quite like this. But I think we can do a little bit better. So I'm going to bring up my player fire script in my other game. I'm not going to let you see it because that's cheating. So basically we do a few things. Well, not, <laughs> we, don't, we do more than a few things here. What I did was I kind of just slashed and burned this whole script right here. There wasn't too much we could salvage from this. Um, but what I did do is I looked at our old uh, timer script that we had. And you know what? I'll go ahead and bring up some documentation on that. All right. Remember in our when we were studying time that time, we had a uh, a timer function going on. And this script right here kind of even tells you uh, how you would program a fire function as well. So here we have them describing the projectile we want to instantiate to fire. And then we have a fire rate here. And then this next fire variable is kind of our timer. And then in our void update, they have two conditions here. If the uh, player presses um, the left mouse click, this is just another way to say left mouse click. And our time dot time is greater than our timer next fire here. And then we set our next fire plus our fire rate that we described, and then we instantiate our shot. So that's this code right here will kind of tell you how to control the fire rate in our game that we want to uh, we have to get going on here. So that timer function will be how you uh, let me get rid of these things. Let me bring up that fire function again. There we go. This timer function right here will kind of get you. This is where I would start looking at. This is how you would fire your weapon. And uh, the thing, the one thing you might also need to do, is, since this is a machine gun, uh, instead of using, let me bring up the old game real quickly. And let me bring up player fire. Instead of going get key down, just try get uh, get key. And that way... I'll go ahead and save this. When you delete that down, let me max my own play. Now when I hold my, now you can see that. If I hold down my left click, now I just have a steady, steady stream of bullets. But since I don't have a fire rate function with that timer included, it just shoots as fast as it can pretty much. All right. So after you uh, get the fire rate figured out, with uh, this timing function right here. Then you're going to have to incorporate a coroutine. All right. And let's look and see the best example of code we've already done. And I think the best place to look at how we can incorporate a coroutine inside of that timer would be maybe our asteroid spawner. All right. So let's say, for instance, we were looking at our spawn asteroids right here. This for loop right here does a few things in our asteroid spawner, right? It, uh, we're going to ignore that it finds the random location for it to spawn, spawn the asteroids at. What interests me is this return new wait for seconds spawn wait. Since this is a coroutine, we start the coroutine called spawn asteroids. 
And then we go here. Since we have a code routine going on, we can incorporate this code right here. And it looks at how many seconds it should wait before it loops back up to start this for loop again. All right. And the spawn count, think of that as your shots to fire. Instead of spawning asteroids, we would have something like shots to fire. And instead of spawn weight, let's have something like burst interval. All right. So with something like this going on, you would nest that within our uh, if statement right here. So we have our if statement. I would say uh, the, way I, the way I would do it is, let's see. Yeah, right under uh, this value right here, right under this line of code, next fire, I'd probably put, let me get to that. I'd probably put this for loop right there. And I'm being really vague because I really want you guys to bust your brains on this. And then inside of, I would leave this line of code to... Let me bring up Mono Develop again, right there. All right, because that's what we're instantiating. So basically, you would have this for loop that waits for seconds inside of our timer uh, uh, if statement right here. All right, so those two ideas right there will allow you to uh, figure out how to get your fire going on. And I'll bring in the game I made real quick, and I can show you what my uh, fire player fire script now looks like in my inspector. All right, let me just get rid of this stuff right here. I'm giving you a sneak peek. So, within my player fire script, I have the bullet I want to instantiate, which is in my prefabs bullet right here, and the missile I want to instantiate, which is in my prefabs right here. And notice I have bullet number of shots the bullet fire rate, and the bullet burst interval. And I have the same thing going on for my missiles right here too. But notice I can infinitely tweak these values right here. So with my machine gun, I only want to fire one shot per burst, and there's going to be no burst interval, and I want to fire at a rate of 0 0.05. Look what happens when I change this to a rate of 0.1. You'll see that my machine gun fires a lot slower okay in that regard i can also turn my machine gun into a burst fire so i can do number of shots to fire to three i can now add what time i want my machine my bullets to fire so i'll do point one there and then let's say i want each burst of fire to be about 0.5 seconds apart watch what happens now when i hold down the mouse button Now we're kind of creating a burst. Let's up this fire rate to two seconds. So every two seconds, I fire a three-round burst. So it's the same thing we had with our right mouse click in the last lecture, last uh, uh, semester. But it's a little bit more robust because I can infinitely tweak this. I mean, I can say, okay, between fire burst, I'll do 1.5. And I'm going to have a five-round burst, and I want them to fire really fast next to each other. Well, look what happens with the gun now. Boom. Heck, you can even have something like a shotgun blast. We can have ten bullets fly every uh, one second, and we can do a really quick interval fire, point one. And look, it's almost like a machine gun, a shotgun. <laughs> And I'm just holding down the left click. I don't need to keep clicking it. So we kind of have like a, a shotgun blast now. I can even be crazier <laughs> and add 0 .005. And it'll be like 20 bullets, let's say. And now we're going to have just a big spray of bullets. 
In fact, let's go even crazier. 0 0.001. I'm just playing around with this thing. But I'm just kind of showing you the functionality we can have here. All right. And in that same regard, we can do that for our missiles too. Maybe we want to fire five missiles at a uh, every two seconds, but really fast. So let's get some of our missiles on screen or our asteroids on screen. I press that once. <laughs> and now we just have our rockets going crazy. <laughs> so I guess those right those missiles are uh, searching for the asteroids. All right. So there's that. Um, yeah. So that's the machine gun burst. Uh, I'm going to quickly uh, wrap this up a little bit. Um, let me get rid of this. So that's how our new fire uh, function will go. Uh, we want to tweak our bullet mover so they get the spray. Basically, all we want to do with uh, this is add a random range. All right. Let me get to our bullet mover. Look at some of the notes I have on the other screen. Um, we want to have a new public float uh, called the spray angle. And the spray angle will be able to tweak uh, at the start of our code. It'll be able to tweak the rotation of our object. So we have a transform position right here. Next, you would also do a transform dot rotation. Or transform dot rotate, forgive me. And then you would plug in an X, Y, and Z rotation based on a random range of your spray angle. So don't forget that you also want to uh, maybe like, I'll do a comment here. Spray angle equals... Uh, random dot range and then when there you have uh, minimum min range and max range and then the spray angle variable will have a uh, random number between these two values right here that you'll plug into this transform dot rotate value right here. And every time a new bullet's created, it'll be rotated a little bit in the correct axis. I'll let you figure out which axis you'll need to rotate it in. It'll be a little bit, it'll be a little pointed in a different direction. So uh, really, I could have my bullets just really inaccurate. Let me bring up the other game real quickly. I could have my bullets go really inaccurate on my machine gun. If I go to my bullet mover, let me go to my inspector, or go to my prefabs bullet, and here's my bullet mover. Here's my spray angle variable. I can just have a really wide angle. See how that's working? Or I can take my spray angle and make it super narrow, so it's almost like I'm shooting straight. But you'll notice it gets a little skewed down at the end. So the spray angle really lets you kind of create the kind of spray you want for your gun. All right. And our missile. Our missile is going to be, uh, it sounds like a big tall order to get it to tracking other uh, uh, different asteroids each time. But it's really just a few lines of code. So I'm going to bring up my missile mover script right here. The first thing we need to do with our, uh, check my notes right quick, is we need to go to our stats, and we need to do something like uh, public bull is targeted. All right, and I'll hit save right there. So now I'll go to my prefab, say asteroid. Now we have a flag that we can check yes or no that checks whether or not the asteroid has already been targeted. All right. That's going to be pretty important. Because when we go back to my code, let me get rid of some of these right here. Can close without saving. Close without saving. Now when I go to my code here, let's look and see what we'll have to do to get it working correctly. 
All right. Scripts. Just bringing up some notes on the other screen real quickly. All right. The first thing we're going to need to do is ah, there we go. We're going to have to go to our for loop right here and declare a new local variable. Local variable to look at the stats on the hazard being measured. All right. And this local variable is going to be something like, uh, uh, I don't know, hazard stats dot is targeted. That's what we're going to be looking for in our, uh, in our code right here because we're going to have to look at the asteroid prefab with the is targeted boolean right there. And then after we declare this local variable, we can get at it. So when we go, if current distance is less than old distance, then we'll do something like and, and then it, generally we would say and the hazard being measured is not targeted. So we look at the distance and we make sure that the hazard is not targeted. And then we assign our code right here. And then the last thing we want to do in this right here is we want to say something like hazard being measured is now targeted. That way, when we loop back around our for loop, the, ha the, the hazard or the asteroid we just uh, set our target to will now uh, be off limits because it will be now targeted. So basically, that's basically how we'll get our, uh, our, our missiles tracking a different asteroid each time. And the simple way that I want you guys to do this with these few lines of code, you'll notice that in the other game, some asteroids weren't targeted, uh, even though maybe they should have been. Well, that's because maybe a missile got occluded by another one and the asteroid uh, or the missile hit another one before it got to the asteroid it was targeted, thus leaving an asteroid in the field that was already targeted by that script. We'll just overlook it. As long as it basically works as uh, I showed in the example right here, as long as it's basically looking like this, <laughs> Let me tweak. Uh, let me tweak that prefab of my missile real quick. I think I got it. I got it shooting way too fast. Or actually, it's on my medium fighter. Let's just shoot three missiles every point zero five seconds. As long as it's basically working like this, we'll be fine. And notice how the missiles just completely skip that one right there. It's because it was already targeted, but the missile never got to it. I'll allow that. I'm not going to try to make this uh, feature too crazy hard to do. So that's fine if you've noticed your missiles are doing something like that. As long as they're basically getting most of the asteroids coming at you. Basically, I just want you to go into your uh, missile code and be able to set flags for all of your targeted asteroids, telling them whether or not they've been targeted. And uh, I'm just going to let you guys figure out how to do the uh, time limit and the score mechanic. I will say this quickly uh, in my stats script right here. Cancel. I had a, uh, a new public int right here called score. And what I did was I just, let's go ahead and save and close that, I guess. I attached my stat, stat script to my game manager. All right. So now my game manager has all these different stats. I don't really uh, worry about the health of the game manager or the shields and the ammo. This is basically where we're going to keep our score right here. Okay. And this score right here is going to point at uh, this little field right here is going to basically control what's displayed there. And the way I controlled the point system, I got some parsing errors going on right now. I'll just ignore that. Um, 
because I just want to show you some of the code real quickly in here. The way I control the uh, scoring system is I did it in collision. Uh, after the object was destroyed, I entered a few lines of code right here after the instantiate, or actually, yeah, after the instantiate, I entered some lines of code that uh, looked at the score value of maybe, let's say, let's go to my uh, asteroid prefab. Now you can see that my uh, on my asteroid I have selected here, the score is set at 100. The score right here is used as how many points it's worth. The score in my game manager is the total amount of points the game I've earned in the game. So that's reflected over here. So basically in uh, the old in the collision script you'll see right here, you'll just uh, look at the score of the object that's been destroyed and add that to your game manager score field right up here in your uh, in the stats that we have all right so in your time uh, that's pretty easy you're going to be using time dot delta time to control that display and uh, originally time dot delta time is a float with three decimal points but you'll see in my game that I managed to round up that float to a whole number inside of the code. So I think you guys might be able to do a quick Google search and go into the Unity forums to see how to do that. Um, if not, just do your best and get at least some kind of time taken up, even if it has a whole bunch of decimal points. All right, so uh, that's basically uh, a general overview of how, I, how you guys are gonna be going about this. Um, if you have any questions, I went over a lot of stuff. Probably a lot of you might be scratching your heads right now because, you know, explaining code can be a pretty mind-numbing ordeal here. Even I'm starting to get a thousand-yard uh, stare going on right now. Um, but if you have any questions because the stuff is uh, maybe a little dusty in your mind or you don't quite get some of my explanations, <clears throat> take a whack at it and do what you can. And if you have questions, just uh, email me or use your Dropbox to show me what work you've done so far so I can see if you're on the right track, and I'll get back with, to you within a, a day or two. And we have three weeks to go through this, so don't wait till the last second because, uh, like I said, um, it'll take about a day or two to get back to your emails. So don't think you'll be able to just be like, oh, I remember everything, and just go through and tweak all this stuff. I mean, even me, it took about uh, an afternoon uh, and an evening's worth to make all these changes just to get everything straight uh, in my own mind. So you guys have three weeks to go through this, and uh, good luck on everything. Please email me if you have any questions, and good luck.